Hello and welcome to another episode of the Odyssey Podcast, where we explore the journeys of people through life and business. I'm your host, Jeremy Mullally. This week's guest is Meng Han Lin. Uh, Meng is the co-owner of Digital Mill, which is a digital marketing agency here in Perth. And he's here to talk about launching his business, which was launched just over a year ago in 2018. So he's going to be chatting about uh, some of the challenges you face when actually making that leap to going full-time with the business. And he's also here to give us some tips uh, around digital marketing here in 2019. But obviously, don't want to spoil too much. So here's Meng. Meng, thanks for coming down. I um, appreciate you making the way down. And you're actually the first guest to bring me gifts in the form of an alcoholic beverage. So <laughs> I appreciate that. So cheers. Cheers to that. Thank you. <laughs> oh. All right. So it's coming on the one year mark since you launched Digital Meal, right? That's yeah, correct. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, so can you actually tell me about uh, the birth of your business? Yeah, sure. Um, so the birth of Digital Meal actually comes from the name itself originally is like uh, an amalgamation or a portmanteau of um, my name, Meng, and my business partner, Kale. So Meng and Kale, and it just somehow became Meal. It will first start off as like a joke, um, I think the name, but then we just sort of like ran with it. It's one of those things where you joke about it, you joke about it, and then it becomes like a serious thing. Yeah, and you actually like that. You're like, oh, that's like, like, not a bad idea. Yeah, not a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. um, and so um, the birth of the idea was because of the fact that me and my business partner, we used to, you know, a long time ago work together and we really enjoyed the experience of working together. Mm-hmm. Um, the only problem was um, we just weren't essentially satisfied with the way that um things were run and this you know like sort of high-end decisions that were made and so when the question comes of well when you're unsatisfied with a particular thing you either change your environment which is what i did and i you know went to another agency and he stayed um it was either change your environment or you know try and do something yourself about it and so i floated the idea to him a couple years ago to go you know if I was to go out and start like my own agency. Would you be interested in taking a partnership in this? And he was sort of on the fence about it because obviously there's so much unknowns with going out on your own. Yeah. Um, but I think I managed to convince him and he was like, yep, yeah, okay. And so he left essentially the planning of most of it to me. Um, and we just had to make sure that we were in like a financial... I guess like financially stable enough so situation to be able to make that commitment and then we go okay well um we set a date to launch and then just went from there yeah yeah i mean we'll sort of get into that a bit more um as we go on but um so would you say uh like the main motivating factor for you when you first started was um uh sort of like a frustration not not necessarily frustration but you you saw how things were done when you worked in other agencies and you wanted to sort of correct those those problems that might have been there yeah sure it was more of like a um any every agency that I ever worked at it seemed to be like the same sort of symptoms or the same sort of um, pain points from working in an agency environment and you know when you're in that sort of situation and you go well I believe it should be run like this I think it was a matter of seeing whether or not the reality matches the theory right so in theory you think that okay something like this could work if you had this kind of process in place but you don't actually know whether or not that's going to work until Until you you actually try exactly until you've actually tried it yourself um because either things are the way they are because of the fact that um just in terms of everything that happens those are the way that you get everything to run in, I guess, like a very stable environment. Or maybe it's just the fact that it's too hard for people to run agencies in a particular way that cultivates like a, I guess, an overall positive culture. Yeah. Yeah. So what, so in other words, when you actually first launched, you weren't even sure whether or not um, you would be able to make those differences. Like we, I mean, you obviously had some some sort of confidence in doing it, but like, were, were you still a bit um, apprehensive when you when you actually came to launch? Um, I, I think like 
the only apprehension came from whether or not the business itself would succeed in terms of the model um, because most businesses, if not all businesses, um, have to have like a foundation of, well, generating revenue, right? Because obviously if you don't generate revenue, then you can't really succeed. Yeah. Um, but the whole foundation um, or essentially my vision of how to run like my own agency was not to be focused on revenue, but to like sort of focus on the people and culture and sort of let business take a back seat to that. And that kind of, it's a very scary sort of thought because you can have a culture, but if you have no work coming in, then you have nothing to sustain that culture. So it was kind of like a, a very risky decision to make like that, but I wanted to see if it was actually possible. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting philosophy and that's sort of anticipated one of my next questions. Um, in terms of culture, what do you, what is it you do? Well, first of all, what do you actually mean by culture? Like, do you mean, uh, I assume you mean uh, not, not just the internal culture of your team, but the broader culture that you present to your clients and things like that. How do you sort of create that culture? Sure. So um, I think um, one of the things that I identified really early on in working different sort of agency environments was the fact that there's a lot of really high skilled talent pools um, in terms of the workforce and you can get like a, a match of really good people that can learn how to cohesively work together and people sort of in a work environment create their own their own sort of work culture. But the problem is that that work culture um, gets affected so much by how management runs things. So you could have like a, a process or a system in place that you work really well with, um, but you could have you know, are micromanaging um, upper management that come in and sort of tweak that or change that or dictate certain things that changes the way that you work the best. Um, and I feel like that's sort of like a really major, big major pain point in terms of um, turnovers because people sort of like, they want to feel like the way that they do things um, needs to be respected or their methods methodology needs to be respected. Um, and I think also one of the problems is that um, in a lot of especially like large scale agencies where you have a lot of top level managers making a lot of business decisions that affects the bottom line. Um, when you have these top level managers um, who haven't been actually doing the work for a very long time, they sort of lose touch in sort of um, what it takes for people to be in like a comfortable zone to be able to do what they do best. And so that's why you then have a clash of, I guess, ideologies of the workers that go, this is how it should be run or how it should be done. And managers that go, no, this is the most effective way. And then usually those two ideas clash. Yeah. So it's like a conflict between management and the, like the team on the ground actually doing the work. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so you, you, the culture you're trying to create is where you, actually merge, merge two yeah merge two yeah so for myself what that means is um in terms of running um the agency um it's about understanding not just sort of what works for me but what the processes and methods other people work within like you know their own their own work methods and try to marry the two together and not just dictate to go this is the way that it needs to be done um, to either, you know, save money or like to get more clients or anything like that and to just respect that process and then and to mold the work um, so that in terms of people working together and the overall business objective that they can sort of marry each other together and not just be a an or situation. Yeah, so yeah. like they're not they're not working against each other, they're like actually working it cohesively together. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. So how many actually how many agencies have you worked digital marketing agencies? I mean, had you worked in before launching um Digital Mill? So in terms of actual permanent work, it was probably like three. Um, and then sort of freelance work among others. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in this industry it's kind of one of those things where when work gets picked up if there's like a shortage um, of hands, which there usually is, um, then 
agencies will reach out and just try and grab as many freelancers as possible because there's actually quite a, a large shortage of skilled workers in um especially in perth so yeah. by that you mean like they might um slightly almost specialize in something is that exactly sort of yeah, yeah yeah so there's like a real sort of um i guess like a a dry season in in terms of special workforce yeah where you have someone that kind of is dedicated to doing one particular thing but really really well yeah yeah and those will be your freelancers who sort of jump who around jump in yeah, yeah exactly yeah. yeah yeah um but my point is really uh what kind of what kind of lessons did you learn from working in those uh digital agencies and how did that sort of um form the way you operate in your own business okay um i think the biggest thing was uh the idea of leadership um and the concept of leadership and what that means. So there's been so many times that you talk, you know, among the other, you know, people that actually do the work, the bottom line, and there's an understanding that, hey, you know, whoever runs the place or owns the agency, they're really, really great people. They're, you know, big people, like, you know, a people person, yeah. but maybe the, there's a disagreement because maybe they don't actually quite get what needs to be done. Um, so there's that distinction between being a manager and being a leader because um, sort of in my understanding, um, a leader is someone that sort of makes a decision in which everyone can agree to follow that path because there's a belief that this person knows exactly you know, what that entails and how that affects yourself. Um, and so that when you follow them, you can be sort of safe in knowing, um, have that trust that this person understands exactly where you're coming from and that he, he or she takes like your interest to heart in terms of furthering the whole business's objectives. And so it's about marrying that and not just seeing the workers as just like a, a piece to just further their own objectives. Yeah, and to not feel used, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So do you think it's, to be a leader, it's important to uh, establish a good relationship with your team then so that you do understand uh, how they can actually be used effectively um, and their skills utilised to the, to the maximum? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think it's just a matter of just communication because um, no matter what industry, it's not, this is not just digital, you know, um, I think there's a lot of places, even in a corporate environment where someone goes, you know, get this done and I need this done by this time. And there's no sort of communication or, or an attempt at understanding, well, if you feel like it needs to be done a different way or you don't think it can be done by a certain time, like, why is that? And trying to get that, you know, that communication line going to try and understand how you can work together to either tweak you know, either change deadlines or change the process um, and rather just going, you know, the onus is on you to get this done because that's your job and that's your role. Yeah. And so I, that creates, I guess, like a lot of pressure and um, can also create dissent as well and just unsatisfaction about just not being valued. Yeah. And I think that's like a really big thing. Like no matter the size of a business, um, the people's need to be valued in terms of what they do is like such a big part of... Um, just overall satisfaction in the workplace. Yeah, so is that also where that poor culture comes from? Like that, like you said, the management being out of touch with the rest of the team? Yeah, yeah, and just yeah. not um, appreciating the value that that person brings along and seeing them more as just like a, a, a piece of, you know, just like an asset that they are there to use rather than to like value like the person's opinions and expertise and just... Um, what they bring I, I suppose yeah I think like the, that that word that you know the concept of value is lost um, in sort of like businesses a lot in m multiple industries yeah yeah just on that um, like you said uh, for the for the leader um, it's important that they can actually be trusted to so you sort of know that they're doing the right thing um, but do you also think that um, uh, it's important that um, sometimes the team can almost not override, but they can have a say in 
they can might actually disagree with the leader and then they sort of uh, negotiate the correct way to work on a project. So in other words, they've got conflicting views, but then they um, perhaps a subordinate team member might actually have a better way to do things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly, absolutely. And I think um, the efficacy of how good a manager is or how good uh, like a leader is is essentially trying to juggle that right it's just trying to juggle um because everyone has their own particular way that they like to work things and especially when you're working with multiple people um sometimes multiple people's ideas can conflict um in terms of what people see as the ideal workflow and i think it's on if you're in a position of power that makes those sort of high level decisions, the onus is on you to be able to effectively like create that process or create a strategy in which um, you get that nice balance where everyone can sort of um, meet in the middle. Um, and I feel like the problem at the moment is that um, the focus has never been on how to get the workers to um i guess like work together with the workers to kind of put something in place um to satisfy everyone's sort of um creativity yeah and rather focus on the client's demands of how they want something done and you know the time frame and the budget in which they want it so because of the fact that a lot of businesses are based upon this revenue model where it's kind of like this is the client demands and this and the client is always right so their needs comes first and then everything else is just essentially Secretary, like a, yeah, yeah a, an assembly of just okay how do we achieve that rather than the other way around so i guess that's why there's sort of um there can be a lot of conflict between um not just workers amongst themselves if they're not able to have like that communication to be able to collaborate properly but also between workers and clients that dissatisfaction of we're not allowed to work the way that we want to because of the way that the client wants that and essentially that's on the management's role to be able to you know meet in the middle essentially yeah, yeah, yeah. those two exactly two ideas yeah um when you first launched digital meal you pretty much hit the ground running so like you were working pretty hard to build up the business um how important would you say is the planning stage before you actually launch and um, what kind of advice could you give to someone who's looking to, they want to launch their business, but they also want to be financially stable. So like actually making that jump to, yeah. to do that financially speaking. Yeah, sure. So um, f for something like this, um, it, the way that I approached it was the same way that I approached sort of any big decision, which is um, a, like a very simple like pros and cons table right um and a risk reward sort of situation so in terms of the planning um it was a matter of just at first research and the research was based upon okay well what is the current um where is the current industry at in terms of work demand and i guess number of suppliers so if we were to enter the market at a certain time um, would we be, would we see fierce competition? Would there not be enough work um, for us? Or, you know, would we be situated quite nicely? So a lot of it was about timing um, and understanding sort of based upon where the industry was headed towards, whether or not that would create like a, an environment in which we could flourish. Yeah, and be sustainable as a business. And exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, and the next thing was probably in terms of financing um, because of the fact that, you know, the way the business started off, a lot of it depends on sort of how much financing you have backing you. Um, myself and Kale, like we didn't take out any loans for this. We didn't borrow any money from, you know, anyone like family, friends or anything. So yeah. for us, it was a matter of, okay, how much can we afford to lose? Um, and sort of planning for the worst, but preparing for the best case scenario. So for us, 
um, we agreed that we would prepare for at least a six month period in which once we first started running, where we would have no inflow, like no inflow of revenue. So we both agreed to prepare at least six months worth of just, okay, we had to sustain ourselves. Um, because for us, we both made a decision that we couldn't properly um, commit to something like this unless we did it full time. So before we actually launch officially last year, um, we did first start off kind of juggling our, both our full time jobs and doing yeah. um, sort of digital meal um, sort of on the side. Um, but what we discovered was in terms of level of commitment, your commitment is always going to be to your full-time job and that, because that's yeah. just the way that it is in yeah. terms of, you know, time resources. And so we both agreed, look, doing something like this for a long-term period isn't sustainable. Um, so how do we get ourselves in a financial situation in which we can actually do this full-time and commit our full-time resources to this? And so that's what we agreed upon. Like for different businesses and different industries, that might be a different number. Luckily for us in a digital industry, um, the overheads are actually quite low um, because especially since we're working from a, like a home office, we don't have to worry about lease. And also in terms of like tools, we don't really need much um, like physical tools and hardware. Yeah. So we just need, you know, essentially a laptop and a really good internet connection. And then mm -hmm. we can sort of like do everything that we need to do. So in terms of overheads, we're quite lucky to be sort of in this particular industry. Um, and so that we just decided based upon that, that six months was sort of like what we needed to prepare for. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, like you said, it's for different industries, that might be a different length of time. Right. Uh, how did you sort of arrive at that figure? Was it literally just crunching numbers or did you sort of have to think about, um, uh, you know, like how are you going to find work and when, when we have enough work to actually sustain you for that yeah that so period, yeah yeah so a lot of it was um sort of based on projections or like playing with numbers so a lot of projecting um what the industry would be like once we actually launch in terms of work demand um so i based that upon just um when i was freelancing for different industries i got an idea or a concept of just um what the current requests were coming in for in terms of um work demands um, and sort of what the hit rate was or success rate was of um, clients coming in wanting work and then the, that agency itself landing a job and then sort of estimating sort of what that demand would be like when in, you know, in a year's time, in two years time, in three years time, et cetera. Um, and then just purely based on personal preference of like, what can you personally survive with if we had no income for X amount of time? Yeah, so the six months was really just a number that we came to based upon like what we were comfortable with. So our our, our risk level or our risk assessment, and that's just what we came up with. Like some people uh, may have like a, a longer turnaround time because, you know, they have other commitments. For example, you know, they've got like a whole like family to support um, or child support or like multiple mortgages to pay, stuff like that. Um, so you just, it's just based upon like what your current commitments are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because you had worked in other agencies, uh, did you sort of have a leg up in the sense that like besides having the actual experience for your profession, did you pick up a lot of um, like business um, business practices that you could sort of implement when you first launched? Like in other words, uh, did it come easier to you? to launch because you had seen how other agencies operated? Mm, that's actually a really good question because there was a lot of, there's not, when you're like working in an agency, you don't see a lot of the back end stuff. And by back end stuff, I, I mean, you know, just uh, things like hiring, paperwork, a lot of the admin side of things. Yeah. So in terms of that, I didn't get to see much of that, um, which would have been actually really helpful because that's probably the stuff that, is the most time consuming. Yeah. Um, but in terms of how bit different agencies set up like workflows um, and how communication lines work in terms of when a project is set up, how to integrate like so many different um, teams and people with different expertises to sort of communicate on a project, seeing stuff like that 
run in different ways was very useful yeah. um, because it kind of gave me sort of like a baseline of um, of number one, what I liked and number two, sort of what I felt would work well. Yeah. This is something I've actually come across a lot because um, we're in kind of a similar industry. Um, like the concept of free work. Um, when is it appropriate to actually do free work and how can you sort of, um, if it is... Is it is it is it avoidable? Um, I think free work is like one of those funny things because, um, especially when you first start out, there's sort of you know that. I guess like the onus is on you to, to sort of prove your worth or prove your value. Yeah. Um, and so, even if you think that your time and your work is worth X amount. Um, without any sort of evidence supporting that people aren't going, especially people that don't know who you are, aren't going to pay that amount. Um, so the way that I see free work is just based upon, um, I think it depends a lot on like you yourself or your team, like what you offer collectively um, and the value you think that represents and whether or not um, that client that, you know, is, has that potential to ask for free work, um, is worth the investment, right? So what I mean by that is if this client is, uh, essentially a once off that probably has no further like opportunities arising from completing this body of work, then the free work may not be worth it unless you're really strapped for cash flow. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the things I found about free work um, or really cheap work as well, a lot of it comes from, I guess, the person who's doing BDM. So if you're running something by yourself, you'd be yourself. If you have like a salesperson, you'd be that person to be able to effectively convey the value because at the end of the day, if someone needs something a particular service or product if they see value in it then they won't have a problem paying for it right because if something needs to be done you're going to pay for that thing to be done right because you're addressing a pain point and i think that um people who get into this sort of um i guess the cycle of needing to feel like they need to offer free work is because they either undermine like their own skill sets and they're just not confident in selling that or they're not effectively communicating the value that it provides to someone right so for us um the free work mentality is sort of it's pretty much not there um the only type of free work that i would do is if um i have people asking for advice or if they're asking for you know just like a look over of like a, a competing um, agency's quote or something like that. Um, but in terms of body of work in which like we act, make actual changes, um, we don't do any free work in that regard. Yeah. yeah. What When you first started out, was was it heavier? In the, were you doing more free or even cheap work just to sort of build up that client base? Um, we were definitely doing like cheaper work. Um, and the cheaper work was essentially just to feel like that that void of needing the cash flow and also seeing sort of um, how we were charging, how clients were reacting to that and then sort of seeing what that outcome was like in terms of, well, for the next project, for this similar body of work, would the level of satisfaction from both ends be met if we raise the price by X amount? So I think like for us, like when we were charging for work at the beginning, it was not only just to get that portfolio go- going, but it's also to get a feel of like what that happy equilibrium is. So it's just like a testing because um, one thing that everyone does is they feel like they're worth X amount, but you have to kind of meet the middle ground of what you feel you're worth and what the market dictates you're worth. And so the only, the, the real you know, pathway to, I guess, failure is if you consistently either overvalue or undervalue yourself. And I think like that's sort of one of like the biggest first hurdles that people get through is that they either have to kind of swallow the ego and maybe go, okay, maybe I'm not worth 
in terms of the level of service I provide as much as what these other guys are offering or to kind of go be more confident in knowing that, hey, actually what I'm producing in terms of body work is actually at this level. So therefore I need to sort of have that confidence to charge that. Yeah, and I think um, a part of the fun essentially of running your own business is kind of like figuring that out and getting to that point and having like these really sort of self-reflective um, conversations with yourself. How did you actually um, uh, figure out the like your value and your prices, um, especially since uh, the biggest expense is your, like your time and labor, you're not actually paying for, um, uh, you don't have a lot of overheads and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so how did you, did, were you just using other, other agencies as like a yardstick to sort of see where you sat or was there a sort of different approach to it? Yeah, sure. So, um, f- luckily for, for myself, because I'm in the digital industry, um, a lot of things, um, can actually be measured. So when someone goes to your website, that can be tracked when someone, you know, contacts the business or buy something off a website, those can all effectively be tracked. Um, so the way that I value things is based upon um, the expectations. So what a client expects in terms of growth and then what I predict or expect that how much they can grow. And so deciding on that number and then looking at those numbers of where they're currently situated and then based upon that, I can sort of, kind of figure out a figure because essentially if we can both agree that we can grow um we can grow your business from an online perspective by 20 percent if we already know how your business has been running and what your actual you know profit and turnover and all that kind of stuff is then we can sort of predict like what 20 percent is worth like what a 20 percent increase is worth to you so based upon that we can go well if this 20% over a year is worth, you know, $10,000, then essentially anything underneath that $10,000 works for both of us, right? And it just becomes a matter of, well, what are we both happy with? Um, and I think that that's something that's very unique to digital uh, because of the fact that um, everything can be tracked and measured. You can get these numbers, um, whereas there's other industries where like you, you probably, you just can't do that. So you just kind of have to guesstimate based upon like what the market dictates, like is the value of someone's time, you know? So luckily for us, like we're in a situation where the number I come up with, I can justify it with the hard figures. Yeah. And is that obviously based on your previous clients? Is that where you get that sort of information as well? Like saying almost proof that you say, yeah, I've, you know, Bob, I gave him a 20% increase. Yeah, exactly. Like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So experience definitely comes into it as well. Yeah. Um, especially, um, in a situation where, um, people aren't very, I guess, knowledgeable or understanding about the digital aspects of their business. Um, having that previous experience to kind of explain and to show, um, it really goes a long way. Yeah. Makes that process a little smoother. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. yeah. And because I think that the one big thing about things like pricing and stuff like that is just a level of understanding. It's goes back to like that word of value of, um, the, why the reasons people feel like they need to offer free work or, um, people feel unhappy that they're, you know, charging out at a less rate is because there's a discrepancy between their perceived value and a client's perceived value. And I think that um, if you want to be in a situation where you're happy charging um, what you think you're worth, you need to first be able to have, I guess, showcase the value that you provide and then be able to effectively communicate that value to potential clients. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sort of moving on, um, I mean, there are a lot of uh, digital marketing agencies mm-hmm. in Perth um, and they probably offer like similar, if not identical uh, services that you yeah. do. What is it that you do to sort of stand out from the crowd and act, but like at the same time, 
being authentic and true to what you believe and what you want to do? Sure. Um, I think that right now um, is a, like a really exciting time in the industry. Um, and I say that because of the fact that it's kind of like a, a free for all where anyone can come out and say that, hey, I'm a digital marketer and I can offer these services, which pretty much any large scale um, digital marketing agency can offer. And so um, it becomes like this gambit of who can showcase a point of difference better than anyone else. And I think for Digital Meal and for us, I think that point of difference um, is uh, myself. So the the thing that I sort of really focused on before Digital Meal was sort of honing in on like one very specific specialty. Um, so my particular specialty is something called search engine optimization, which is getting um, people's websites visible in Google. And I spent pretty much like all my entire career before digital meals sort of like really honing in on that one particular specialty and then sort of committing my efforts around really really understanding that space so really understanding um how other people are doing this um not just in perth but also nationally and also um overseas as well um and also getting that experience of actually seeing the workflows of other agencies. So the the great thing about being in digital space is that because of the fact that um, people tend to jump from place to place because it's, it's, it's expected, you actually get to see um, and experience a lot of, I guess, like different, um, you get to experience a lot of different opinions and you get to experience a lot of um, different types of industries and you get to experience a lot of different methodologies that people practice and then you can kind of um, take that and then mold something of your own yeah actually adopt those things that you're yeah. seeing from other yeah sure um, and I think that that was the one thing that I was just really really committed to was to sort of gain as much of that sort of valuable knowledge and getting insight into how things are run how things were done um, and what worked and what didn't work. And then purely based off that, um, I was able to essentially kind of build my entire like presence and portfolio around the fact that if you had a question or if you needed anything done in this space, uh, like You're the guy to I, go was, to. I was the guy to go to, yeah. right? Yeah. And it was a matter of me sort of, I didn't have to mark myself in that regard because for me, um, my focus was kind of, it was almost like probably almost to like an unhealthy point of just like fixation of like trying to hone that skill that people kind of just notice that. And so yeah. for me, like I didn't really have to go out and market the fact that, oh, I'm actually a specialist in this because people kind of knew that. Oh, Everyone had heard of you because of that reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, do you spend a lot of time uh, looking at what others are doing in your industry? Yeah. So, yeah, and like to this day, you still yeah. do that? Why is that? Is that just to keep up with, to, so you don't fall behind or is it other reasons? Um, yeah, for, yeah, for me, I believe like, um, especially with this industry, like with digital, everything moves at like a very, very fast pace, right? So like what can work last year may not be what works this year. And the scary thing about the speed in which digital evolves is the fact that what could have worked last quarter may not work this quarter yeah, and so, so you do have to keep up yeah, yeah and you do sort of have to keep up and those that don't keep up will either fall behind or they're gonna essentially become and this is the one thing they want to avoid is they'll essentially become the decision makers that make the wrong decisions because of the fact that they don't know what's going on and I feel like that is actually a really large problem in agencies because of the fact that there's like a dependency on managers to kind of hope that their workers will know and update themselves and educate themselves 
on everything that's currently happening in the industry and to sort of upskill themselves and to kind of keep on top of things that they take, you know, a back seat and go, I'm just going to trust that. They know what they're yeah. doing. Yeah. And I kind of don't want to ever be in that position um, because I want to be able to understand and to also kind of make a decision in which it takes that into account. So for me, um, it's just about not sliding back. Yeah. And not becoming complacent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I don't need to tell you how important marketing is, obviously. Yeah. But um, what are some uh, basic but crucial marketing tips that every business should be following in this day and age? Yeah. Uh, did, did, like in the digital space. I, I'm oh, speaking. okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think in terms of the digital space, um, the one thing that you need to, that most businesses need to understand is that there's like a delicate dance between um, furthering your brand um, and pushing your MVPs or um, your minimal viable pro- your minimal minimum viable products. So. What I see a lot, um, and this is actually so crazy to me, is like even with like really, really large scale businesses and operations, is that there's no, un- there's no sort of like strategy around that balance of kind of getting your brand awareness out, as well as um, pushing particular products or pushing particular services to very individual people. I find a lot of businesses will either commit entirely to just pushing the product services or only committing to their brand awareness. And to me, that's sort of really surprising because of the fact that um, everything sort of goes hand in hand with digital, right? And that to essentially market yourself properly, you need to be able to marry the two um, so that you can situate yourself in a way that you can grow from a brand perspective, but also have like a base of like loyal customers or loyal clientele because you haven't foregone that aspect as well. So I think it's about that dance of sort of understanding um, that marketing is more than just one particular thing. Um, It's about number one, multiple things. And also the fact that um, measurement is like a is like a really big part of marketing that you can't sort of ignore or forego. So many businesses that are committed to spending money in traditional advertising, such as print, TV, radio, it's ridiculous that when you ask anyone that commits to a very large budget into these sort of mediums and you go, what is the return on this? Or what is the actual outcome or effect of spending in this space that you get a blank face? Mm -hmm. Now that's really, really scary to me because that kind of goes against the whole concept of digital marketing, which is that everything is measurable and then, yeah. yeah, And that you're accountable for all the dollars that you spend in a marketing perspective. Um, Not to say that you can't measure things from like a, an offline perspective, but the fact that people don't really know or care about measuring any of this activity, that's when we get into like what I call like the red zone or the danger zone of clients not understanding value in marketing and having the unwillingness to spend in marketing because because they haven't been tracking or measuring like what that level of success is, then there's like a fear of commitment or a fear of essentially marketing in an effective way because of the fact that they don't know what's happened once they've committed that, that you know, that budget. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I say like measurement is like the number one thing and just understanding the value of the budget that you're committing to anything that you're doing. That's yeah. like such a big thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to look a bit backwards now. Um, mm-hmm. uh, if you were to go back to when you first launched Digital Meal, is there anything you would do differently? And if so, why is that? I think 
the one thing that I would have done differently is probably, and this is just like a personal thing for me, is to understand the admin side of things more because I think for myself, I really, um, I kind of, Oh, like un uh, underestimated the importance of admin, right? Like just very simple things like contracts and um, invoicing and, you know, um, like pay slips and um, employee contracts and stuff like that. Like just everyday admin stuff, I really, really over like underestimated the importance and the time resource that I'd be committed to that. Yeah. And so I think if I went back and do it all again, I would have, before launch, I would have sort of kind of committed to actually upskilling myself in that particular department um, so that I would get a better idea of like the processes that were needed for that particular aspect. Yeah. Because I was so focused on like the services that we provide and honing that particular skill so that we'd be able to provide a level of service I was happy with that I kind of sort of almost just didn't really focus on just all the back end stuff that had nothing to do with the services we provided, just, yeah. you know, just the admin stuff. Yeah. So don't overestimate admin is the advice I give myself if I had to, you know, go back in time and do it again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think it's definitely something that can uh, bog you down and, you know, you, you won't be able to spend time on doing the things that, that you're actually, you... the reason you started the business essentially. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're sort of coming to the end now. Mm -hmm. Um, my final question really is what kind of plans do you have for the future of digital meal? Do you have anything down the road that's, uh, exciting? Um, in terms of projects, we've got some, um, interesting projects coming up, um, that I'm looking forward to, to working on, but in terms of, um, from a company perspective, um, looking to add more team members, um, in this financial year. Um, and then moving on to our own space, um, essentially just scaling. So the next part of the journey, um, which is essentially like how to scale and how to scale in a way that sort of won't jeopardize the vision, which is to have that culture and to um, have that position as like a leader and not kind of morph into the thing that, made me want to do this in the first place yeah um so i think that that's the next step is the the scalability of the of the business and that's something that i'm looking forward to yeah brilliant meg we've come to the end of the show oh. I, pre I appreciate you coming down happy to come yeah and um i really we've got to thank you for bringing the whiskey um in fact i might even uh request each new person that comes to the show has to bring. Yeah, bring I think so. I think so. Bring, bring something for me to drink. That should be a new standard. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, but yeah, appreciate you coming down, Ming. No problem.